So, listen, I know this sounds almost fake, but 19 years ago, back before Messi had even debuted for Barcelona, Ronaldo was already playing his first international final. Nowadays, it's hard to picture a world where those two aren't seen as football gods, but before that tournament, Ronaldo was only a rotation player at United, he had only scored 12 goals over his whole career and had only once played a full 90 for Portugal. But the thing is, it was there that everything changed. Once the tournament was done, everyone in Europe knew his name. He was easily the highest rated wonder kid in the world and would place 12th in the Ballon d'Or at the end of the year. And I know, that sounds like a success, but in reality, I truly believe that to this day, that tournament, that final, is the biggest tragedy of his career. Because that day, Portugal became the only host nation in the history of the European Championship to reach the final and come out defeated. And even more personally for Ronaldo, not only was it his first tournament, but it was the last tournament his father would get to watch before passing away. As Ronaldo would say, he used to tell his friends that his son would become the best in the world. Now, I've won all of these trophies and he didn't get to see any of that. Still, even though by the time Portugal reached the final, things seemed almost destined to be with everything coming together, at first, it was a complete mess. You see, after a disastrous World Cup in 2002 where the golden generation didn't even make it out of the group stage, the federation was so desperate to make sure such a disaster wouldn't repeat at the 2004 Euros that they sacked their manager and went straight to heaven and signed a coach who had just won the World Cup. They just took him, but then... Well, things didn't improve. After 15 matches in charge, Scolari had only managed to win less than half of them. It didn't seem like the golden generation would be getting their hands on some silver anytime soon, and to make things worse, the fans weren't even on their side. Some were upset that Brazilian-born Deco had been included in the squad, as they felt he was only joining because of Scolari. Others were upset over the cost of hosting the tournament. I mean, it was a half a billion dollar investment in a country regarded as the poorest in Western Europe. They were literally building 10 stadiums for a 16-team competition, it made no sense. Regardless, in an attempt to shake things up, Scolari began turning his back on some of the golden boys, sending João Pinto and Sergio Conceição away in favor of the likes of Quaresma and Simão, but none of that came even close to being as important as what happened next. One day, Scolari was just going about his business when Murtosa, who had just gotten back from watching an under-18 match, came up to him in a rush, looking all flustered, and told him, my goodness, Philippe. They have a kid over there, a winger, is like a horse, just out of this world, he's strong, he's fast, and Scolari just interrupts him and tells him, calm down man, we have Figo and Quaresma in that position, we don't need that kid. And so, Murtaza replied, you don't get it, this one is a phenomenon, we have to call him up. Despite his insistence, Scolari moved on without thinking much of that conversation. It wouldn't be there that he'd become familiarized with the name Cristiano Ronaldo, but over the next two months, that kid, he made sure he'd remember his name. In fact, soon after that conversation, Ronaldo's name was even left out of the team sheet for the under-19 European Championship. That's how much of a question mark he still was in the heads of many of the scouts. Some were convinced they had struck gold, others thought it was just another 17-year-old winger with some flicks and tricks. But regardless, when a month later the chance to play the Toulon tournament came up, the ones who believed in him put their foot down, managed to get his name on the team sheet and... What can I say, Ronaldo didn't just take part, he took over and won the whole thing. By the end of the tournament, he was the star and everyone who opposed his call-up to the European Championship was regretting every single one of their words now that it was too late to make any amends to that team sheet. And trust me, it only got worse when Portugal made it all the way to the final only to lose to Italy, the same team Ronaldo had beaten to the title just three weeks before. From there on out, maybe it was his renewed confidence that led him to keep on blowing past expectations, but with every preseason friendly at Sporting, Ronaldo seemed better and better, until the time to meet Man United came up. And well, everyone knows what happened there. Ronaldo forced legends of the game to bow down to a teenager and admit defeat, humiliating United with a 3-1 win. By the time Ronaldo got home, his phone must have been already buzzing because United knew one thing, they weren't gonna be able to beat this guy so they might as well have him on their team. And obviously, once he became the most expensive teenager in Premier League history, Scolari was more than convinced that Murtaza was right. 
This kid was a phenomenon and above all, it was his light at the end of the tunnel, his secret weapon to turn their fate around at the Euros. If just a while back it was a matter of opinion whether or not he should join the under-19s, now his call up to the main team wasn't even up for the bait. And right on his first match, even the golden boys could tell that he would shine brighter than all of them and as he kept running full speed at the opposition's defense over and over again, some even worried for him. Fernando Cote would even be seen yelling onto the pitch, breed kid, breed. They all could see that he was a different beast. In the locker room he was never once shy, even there he kept on playing, trying to dribble his teammates. He'd go into the showers to play foot volley, they say at times he would go so hard that by the time they were supposed to head to the tunnel, he would already be drenched in sweat. Scolari would literally have to lock the ball bags away so that he would get some rest. But if his mentality was already on another level, it was only helped by the players yet alongside him. As Scolari would say, his teammates enabled his mentality. They weren't annoyed by him, they were amused. They handed him the ball and said, there you go kid, make some magic, we're here to help you. They were more than a team, they were a family. And thanks to that, even through all the disappointment in the preparation matches, everyone went into the Euros believing that, after the 15 years of unfulfilled potential since they had won the Under-20 World Cup, the new blood could help them make history. But then, they went into the opening match against Greece with the world watching and once again let everyone down. Seven minutes in, they were already losing. At half time, Ronaldo came on, but as Costinha would say, he was so eager to make a change, he was going so hard at every ball that he made a mistake. Ronaldo conceded a penalty. He would still go on to score before the match ended, but that wasn't enough to ease the pain. Portugal simply had to win those kinds of matches. I mean, before the tournament, one of the Greek players that admitted their only goal was to try to win a match, and Portugal simply allowed them to run them over like that. Something had to change, and so Scolari took some desperate measures. First, he gathered the team in the bus and gave them a reality check. You know what this means? We're already in the knockouts. We had one chance to mess up and now it's gone. And once that was done, he made one decision that would completely change the course of the tournament. He looked at his bench and realized he had three Champions League winners sitting on the sidelines. So he began starting every single one of those players and things instantly changed. Only seven minutes into the second match, two of them, Deco and Manish, combined for the first goal, then Ronaldo came in late and assisted Rui Costa for the second, and just like that, the only team standing between them at the knockout stages was none other than their eternal rivals, Spain, a team they hadn't beaten in 23 years. Regardless, by halftime, the match was still locked at a goalless draw, and that's when something odd happened. The Spanish coach began yelling onto the pitch, warning his players that Russia had unexpectedly defeated Greece, meaning that if both teams settled for a draw, they would both go through. We all began bargaining with Portuguese striker Nuno Gomes, but maybe it was because he wanted first place, maybe it was because of the rivalry, but towards the end of the match, it was him who broke the deadlock, scoring an incredible goal to send Spain out of the tournament. However, what they didn't know then was that scoring that goal meant Greece was through to the knockout stage. Yeah, I guess you could say that karma would strike very soon. Regardless, back then, there was no time to think of that because the following match would be a legendary one, Portugal versus England. One golden generation versus the other, but very different paths towards the tournament. While Portugal had struggled, England hadn't lost a single match in their qualifying campaign. Even if we had Ronaldo, Figo, Rui Costa and Deco, they had Rooney, Owen, Gerrard and Lampard, it would be far from easy and three minutes into the match that was confirmed, Owen had already scored. I gotta be honest, things got pretty scary at that point, especially when the game hit the one hour mark with no changes to the score, it seemed no matter how much Cristiano bullied Ashley Cole nothing would change, but then Scolari had maybe his greatest stroke of genius of the tournament. Over a period of 16 minutes, he made three changes. He subbed off his defensive midfielder to sub in Simão, a young, hungry, creative genius. Then he subbed out Figo for Pustiga, adding another goal-scoring threat up front while opening up more space for Simão on the wing. And finally, he risked it all, bringing out one of his defenders in favor of Rui Costa. Portugal 
were all in. And just four minutes later, it was exactly Simão who assisted Postiga for the goal that would send the match into extra time. And once there, it was Rui Costa who put Portugal in front with a signature magnificent strike. Scolari was 3-for-3. Three three. It was an in-game managerial masterclass. Everyone involved deserved the win, but then Lampard scored and the game was sent into penalties and the shootout was a true blockbuster. Beckham skied it, so did Rui Costa, Ronaldo smacked it in with no regard for what was on the line, Pustiga hit the panenka, and then Ricardo pulled off one of my all-time favorite footballing moments. With the shootout going into sudden death, Ricardo gets hit, takes off his gloves, saves the next penalty, tells Nuno Valente to stand back, warning him that he would be the one to take the next penalty. And he scores, sending Portugal onto the semi-finals. That was simply one of the most badass things I've ever seen. And it was at that moment that everyone truly began to believe that anything was possible. And rightfully, in the next game, in the semi-finals versus the Netherlands, Portugal dropped maybe their most impressive performance. And of course, at the center of it all was Cristiano Ronaldo. Every time he touched the ball, you could feel the fans rising up from their seats. And then, in one blow, 26 minutes into the match, he floated above the defense and added in the opener, taking off his shirt and celebrating like he was already the best in the world. Imagine the audacity, as Pauleta would say, what a son of a is just different, a monster, doing something like that at that age, that's not for everybody. Right then, everyone realized he wasn't just a great player, we were looking at one of the greatest entertainers in sports history. And of course, he didn't stop there. At around the hour mark, the ball goes out for a corner. It should have been Figo taking it, but once again, that audacity kicked in. Ronaldo grabbed the ball and took the corner so quickly that by the time the camera crew caught up to what was going on, the ball had hit the net. With the assist from Ronaldo, Manish had scored one of the greatest goals in the history of the Euros. And with George Andrade scoring an own goal five minutes later, let me tell you, if it wasn't for Ronaldo's defiance, we may have never made it to the final, but thanks to him, following semi-final defeats to England in 66 and France in 84 and 2000, Portugal had finally made it to an international final. All that was left to do was beat Greece and seize the moment. Going into the final, the sentiment was much different from before the tournament started. By getting past every adversity, the team had completely won over the hearts of the people. Those final weeks transcended just football. Suddenly, the Euros were more than an event. They changed Portugal, they defined the decade, and at that moment, the entire country was behind them. Scolari asked the people to hang flags on their balconies, and suddenly, it was hard to even find a store that hadn't run out of stock. It is estimated that 5 million flags were hung, that's more than one flag for every family in the country. It was complete euphoria and when the team bus drove off on its way to the stadium, well, no one will ever forget those images. There were fans everywhere, those who had planes watched from above, those who had boats waited by the bridge, there were people on horseback, there were people on motorcycles, there wasn't even any need to close off traffic on the highway, everyone stopped just to catch a glimpse of their heroes and honestly, it was hard to tell who was more in awe, the people or the heroes themselves who couldn't believe the amount of love they were receiving. As Rui Costa said, the whole country carried us in their arms all the way to the stadium. After beating Spain, England and the Netherlands, there was a sense that Portugal could not lose, let alone to Greece. Before that year, they had never won a single match in a major tournament. Hell, they hadn't even scored the goal. In the eyes of many, Greece had no right to be there. Quoting The Guardian, they were the only underdogs in history that everyone wanted to see get beaten. Greece had made their way to the final while averaging 48 tackles per match, never beating a single team by more than one goal. All of their knockout stage goals came from crosses to the box. They were defined by boring play, tactical rigidity and discipline. To the average fan, they were nothing more than anti-football. But in reality, as I've said many times, 
There is beauty in ugly football. As much of a paradox as that may seem, the Greeks were truly special. The lack of flair was replaced with an unbreakable bond. They weren't 300, but they were 23 men who through sheer grit and persistence had managed to land themselves at the top of the footballing world. They were a band of inglorious renegades with no regard for the system. They weren't anti-football, they were anti-culture, and being known as Piratico, meaning the pirate ship, it was only right that they would be the ones to pillage all of the silverware and sink the heroes of the sea. Once the match got going, it should have been of no shock to anyone that 9 minutes in, the time wasting had already started, and even less, that it would all be defined by one single goal, an ugly one, a cross into the box. It was their only corner of the match, their only shot on target, but also all that they needed to make that match the greatest tragedy in Portuguese football history. And as with any Greek tragedy, it ended in tears. The cameras closed in on Ronaldo and the kid simply could not stop crying. At the time it was devastating, but looking back now, there's something marvelous about it. Because as Costinha said, it's funny they got those tears on camera. That was the moment a star was born. And if you doubt its significance, let me tell you one final thing. When Ronaldo got to the locker room, he watched as most of the golden generation claimed they wasted the country's final chance at glory. He stood up and told him, I know this won't be the last one. Once again, he was defiant.